Thanks, Rob, and uh, and to Alex and Netta for putting together this uh, uh, this week of activity. It's been a lot of fun so far, and I'm really looking forward to some more of the talks coming up. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, mostly this paper that just came out uh, a month or so ago uh, in collaboration with Don Rolf and uh, also uh, the work that came out in, in February early this year, uh, which has been following up on some of these ideas of uh, islands and page curves and putting it in the context of work that was done in the, in the 80s and 90s about baby universes and so forth and so forth. Um, so um, just before I start, I'll just say um, I've got an eye on the chat. And uh, so if people want to ask questions as we're going along in there, then I'll hopefully uh, spot that and, and maybe can, uh, can answer as you go along. And I'll try to pause to, to let people ask questions by voice if, that, if they prefer to do that as well. So um, hopefully you can have uh, some nice discussion as well. Great. Uh, so the context, I hopefully don't have to give too much of an introduction to many of these ideas as uh, uh, we've been thinking about it a lot over the last uh, couple of years. Um, but this all goes back to this, this old question that we know, you know, for a very long time that uh, the black holes have these nice sort of thermodynamic properties. And in particular, uh, they have a temperature and they have an energy. So they naturally have an energy, which is um, given by the, the area and Planck units. And uh, a very natural once you've got a, a thermodynamic entropy is to ask whether this has a sort of statistical mechanical origin as we, as we know entropy usually does in other words does this count states and um so we can sum this up i want to sum this up in uh, in what i'll call uh Einstein hawking unitarity i think this is an idea that's been around but hasn't really had a a, a name because it's it's the idea is a little bit more than just unitarity that that black holes are unitary quantum systems. It's got this extra assumption about the, about the density of states. This is more or less equivalent to what um, uh, Ahmed and collaborators called um, the central dogma in their, in their review, if you're familiar with that. Um, but the idea is that we can basically replace a black hole with, uh, and think of it as just an ordinary quantum system. If we're far away from it and we can throw stuff at it and see what comes out and all the measurements that we'll ever do will be compatible with this idea that it's basically just an ordinary quantum system. The density of states is given by this Beckenstein Hawking entropy. Uh, so uh, today, uh, I want to test this idea by really looking at uh, observables, things that you can really, in principle, uh, measure by doing some experiments and using only uh, low energy semi-classical gravity. So in particular, uh, I don't want to make any assumptions at all about having some uh, duality any SEFT. I'm not going to use anything like that. I don't want to use any ideas from string theory or other UV completion that's more speculative. I really want to use the things that we know, that we, that we see in nature, general relativity and quantum mechanics, uh, and see what our expectations should be from semi-classical gravity. Um, and of course, the, uh, the old response to this is that semi-classical gravity is not compatible with this. This is uh, before sort of 18 months or so ago, if this would be the answer, uh, it's, it's that these just aren't compatible um, because there's a conflict between these two ideas. Uh, first of all, in perturbative quantum gravity, by which I mean uh, you sort of do quantum field theory on a fixed black hole background, include uh, the effects of say, uh, emission of gravitons by Hawking radiation, by by some perturbative effects uh, that correct that background, um, you get thermal Hawking radiation, as we know. So in particular, the entropy of that Hawking radiation, the von Neumann entropy, just increases over time. But on the other hand, uh, it's if we accept this Bekenstein Hawking unitarity, it looks like the, uh, the entropy of Hawking radiation should be bounded by this Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole, simply because this is this, we can think of this as an entanglement entropy and the entanglement is bounded by the size of the, the smaller system, which in this case would be the black hole. So we have these two, uh, two sorts of entropy. One is this, this thermal entropy of Hawking radiation that just increases forever. Uh, and the other is, uh, is this Beckenstein Hawking entropy. And after this time, uh, uh, this time U page, so U is uh, a retarded time, we'll see uh, in a moment, uh, you get some tension between these ideas. So there's a few possibilities that have been floating around for ages. 
okay, either it's a unitary common system and it follows the curve that, that, uh, that's implied by this, uh, this beckinsey hogan unitarity idea, or maybe that's just wrong and there's either information loss or there's some remnants or something like that. But the important thing we're going to concentrate on is what happens at this early time and the difference between, say, the red curve and the green curve and, and, and Kermit Hill difference. Okay. Um, and jumping ahead, um, the conclusions we're going to come to are, uh, are the following. That uh, actually, in contrast with this old idea that there's a tension here, if we just use semi-classical gravity, we get a completely consistent, coherent picture where everything makes sense, um, where this, uh, this calculation of perturbative quantum gravity, thermal Hawking radiation, is correct. Uh, so a way of saying this is that we don't know a way of modifying Hawking's calculation of the state of radiation. But also, at the same time, Beckenstein-Hawking unitarity is correct. This idea that you can describe a black hole oops, uh, as an ordinary quantum system with, uh, with this number of states, that's also correct. So this seems very strange uh, to begin with. Um, and the thing that makes this possible is uh, that observers doing experiments on black holes live in superselection sectors. Uh, I'll, I'll describe what this means later as we go along. And this large entropy of Hawking radiation that you get from perturbative quantum gravity is due to entanglement with a system I'll call baby universes, which is some, uh, some system that you can't see. Uh, so it's completely unobservable in principle so there's this large radiation between a, super selection, uh, between a superposition of different superselection sectors, uh, but that doesn't affect results of experiments. And experiments get this result because they are telling you something about an individual superselection sector. So that, that's where we're going in the end. And, um, uh, and this is the, the outline for what we're going to do. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is uh, what, I, what sort of observables we're interested in. So I've emphasized we want to make this operational. We want to ask, what do we predict for experiments? And the entropy is not actually a directly experimentally accessible thing. It's only something you infer from, from a certain set of experiments. So I'll talk about that to begin with. Then we'll uh, have a, uh, a short piece on, on semi-classical gravity and replicable wormholes. Uh, most of this we've come to know and love over the, last, um, over the last few months. So I won't have to go into too many details, hopefully, but just give the, the outline. Uh, and perhaps a few a few things that'll be new to, to some people. Um, and then lastly, we'll talk about this idea of, uh, of, of how we, we make all these things consistent by using these ideas of baby universes and so forth. Okay. Um, so uh, let's start. We're, um, uh, as I've already emphasized, we want to ask what predictions are for experiments that are performed by asymptotic observers. Um, so first of all, I'll say these diagrams are all going to be with flat asymptotics, uh, just to emphasize it doesn't actually matter very much that we're working with flat asymptotics for the details, but it's going to help underlie the idea we're not using any kind of duality ADS CFD, anything like that. Um, good. Okay, so, so the von Neumann entropy is not a directly observable thing, because it's, it's not a linear function of a density matrix. Trace row log row is not something that you can, it's not an expectation value of an operator. Say. Uh, so the only way you can deduce the uh, von Neumann entropy is by doing measurements on multiple copies of the state. You've got to prepare several copies and do either many measurements on all these copies or perhaps joint measurements on, on, on the state. Uh, so one simple way to do that uh, is uh, what's called the SWOT test. So Hayden and Preskill introduced this in the context of black hole physics in their, in their uh, beautiful paper and described this as a way to tell pure states from mixed states with a simple uh, measurement. Uh, you just measure an operator, S, perfectly ordinary operator that you, you can measure that just takes two systems and exchanges them. So it's defined like this. Uh, and its expectation value, uh, if you have two copies of a state with density matrix row turns a row, it's two copies is just the trace of the square of the density matrix, which is uh, it's called the purity, and it's related to an entropy, or at least a Renyi entropy. So this is a S2 is a second Renyi entropy of the state. And this really is something you measure. So this is uh, this is the only slide with data, and I can't promise any data on black holes, but this is with trapped ion systems, people are actually measuring the swap operator and, uh, and getting the entropy. Okay, so this, um, this generalizes. Uh, so instead of taking two copies of a system, we can take n copies, and we can uh, measure an operator that cyclically commutes them. So it takes the states on psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, up to psi n, and it uh, makes the state psi 2, psi 3, psi n, psi 1. So 
just permutes everything. And if you have uh, n copies of this state, um, so rho, the nth tensor power of rho, and you, uh, and you uh, measure this operator, the expectation value of that, which is this trace, uh, is related to, to a Ren entropy. Uh, and in particular, the, the von Neumann entropy you can recover from this as a, a formal uh, limit as n goes to one, which would be something useful later on. So this is a simple measurement that you can in principle go, to, go and do. Uh, and this is the, the main thing going to study. So um, I'm actually gonna give this, this funny name for a moment that I'll explain um, in, a, in a second, is we're going to create a state, which I'll call rho n. So this is the state of Hawking radiation for n black holes. So we're going to prepare n, n states of, um, uh, of matter that are going to collapse to form a black hole. We're going to take them to be identical and we're going to separate them very, very widely in space or time. And then we're going to collapse black holes. We're going to collect the radiation and then we're going to bring all the radiation together in our quantum computer or something at the end and measure this, this operator U sigma that exchanges them. And once we've done enough measurements, we'll eventually be able to, to work out what this, this quantity is. Uh, just by averaging the, the results of, of many, many experiments. Uh, so this is something we can measure directly. And, uh, and in particular, we can uh, take a, a formal limit. It'll be something useful just to, to help sort of package things uh, as n goes to one, which, um, okay, it's rather formal at the moment, but, uh, but we're going to interpret this as a volumen entropy that you might deduce as, a, as an observer if you created many, many, many states of, uh, of Hawking radiation, did lots of measurements, you're very sophisticated, you would eventually deduce some entropy for that state. Uh, so why have I bothered calling it the swap entropy? Because I told you that it was just, it was the Renyi entropy or the ordinary Renyi entropy. Um, it's because uh, there was an assumption going into that. Uh, there's an assumption that the, the N copies of Hawking radiation have a state which is just a tensor product. So it's just n copies of some state row. Uh, if this is true, if it really is a tensor product, then uh, this you know, I have to find that the swap entropy is the entropy. That's why I've defined it like that. But this really is an assumption. And in particular, using semi-classical gravity and taking semi-classical gravity seriously, uh, this assumption is not true. And in particular, this swap entropy is very different from the actual von Neumann entropy of the state. This S of U is just the von Neumann entropy of a single copy of Hawking radiation. So this will, will sort of be the, the main point in the end. Okay, so I might just briefly pause to see if there are any questions about, about this observable. Good. Okay, in that case, I'll... Uh, um, Um, Jonathan has asked a question in the chat. Um, that's, um, yeah, there may be other things you can do to try to measure information loss. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe, but this is the way I'm going to try to, to, to ask about information loss. This is sort of a, a fairly traditional setup. Um, there are perhaps other things you can do, but um, if it's, we think it's going to be different, then you should definitely ask the question at the end. Good. Good. Jonathan and the rest of the audience, if you raise your hand, I'll see it on the on the participant list and I can unmute you. But carry on, Henry. Great. Okay. So um, uh, I've told you what observable I'm interested in. Uh, so the next step is to tell you how I'm actually going to, to compute predictions for the, the measurement of that observable. And I'm going to use uh, a semi classical <laughs> gravitational path integral with a uh, chill just define now. So I really want to only use the low energy theory. So this is stuff we've already measured, stuff we know is there in the world. So we've got some uh, GR and matter, and um, I'm going to use a, a integral formulation. It's just a convenient way of, of packaging things. Um, one sort of minor thing to, to emphasize is I'm going to really say things in a language of a, a Lorentzian path integral. There's this idea that you need a, a Euclidean formulation of a theory to get these replica wormholes. So I, I'm just going to present it in a way that, that shows that that is that you can really regard it as a as a sort of a purely Lorentzian path integral. So that's sort of a fairly minor point, but um, might be something slightly new. 
Okay, so we're going to define a path integral like this. Is uh, uh, We've got an integral over metrics and integral over some matter fields. There's a matter action and there's some Einstein Hilbert action, maybe higher derivative corrections and so forth. Uh, and one thing you can uh, do in principle is for each metric, uh, you can solve for the matter path integral to give yourself a matter effective action. This just defines SF. And the way I'm actually going to compute this path integral, because of course we don't really know how to define it, is to look for saddle points in this combination. That is the gravitational action plus the matter effective action. Uh, and and that, uh, finding those saddle points, you've got to use a bit of maybe a bit of ingenuity. Maybe there are saddle points that you, you don't spot to begin with, but the general strategy is to look for all the saddle points you find, you can find, and then we'll, um, and then we'll interpret their contributions to some path integral. Uh, then the last thing I have to tell you is what boundary conditions I'm using. And uh, again, we're going to be using asymptotically flat space. So I'm always going to be fixing the, the geometry uh, asymptotically. Um, but integrating over metrics or allowing the metric to be anything I like away from those, those asymptotics. So and this is really just a generalization of what we do computing scattering in ordinary quantum field theory is we fix states by some um, function of fields at say scry minus and scry plus, and we integrate over all values of the fields in the interior of, of, uh, of space time. Uh, and we're going to follow the same philosophy. It's just that, that one of these fields now is the metric. Uh, and we're going to allow, in particular, uh, various topologies. And we'll see the topologies that are going to be important, which I think we know already what they're going to be, given the, uh, at the conference. Uh, and we don't want to use any, because uh, we don't want to use uh, some UV stuff. We want to avoid uh, regions of strong curvature and so forth. OK, so in this framework, um, uh, the path integral of some of these things may be uh, slightly unfamiliar. So um, we're going to start slowly from something hopefully very familiar, uh, which is just Hawking's calculation. I'm going to start with quantum field theory on a fixed background and build up to, to where we're ultimately going to go. So if you've got some operator, uh, O, which acts on uh, scry plus, which acts on the Hawking radiation, uh, and we want to compute its expectation value. Uh, so we've got, we've prepared some state of matter that collapses. It forms, so maybe there's this star that I've prepared in the past and it collapses, it forms a black hole and so forth. Um, I want to compute the, some, expectation value of an operator on scribe plus. The way we can do that is you, uh, you uh, to just do a Heisenberg evolution of that uh, operator back to scry minus. So for example, with free matter, you just have to solve the equations of motion, you get some Bogley above coefficients. And, so forth. Uh, and once we've done that Heisenberg evolution, you've rewritten this operator O on scribe, to find on scribe plus in terms of some operator, which is probably more complicated acting on scribe minus. And then you can just type that directly in the initial state which is sort of the ingoing vacuum most of the time, apart from this distant past. Uh, so for example, you can compute some occupation numbers of free fields. So this is all very familiar. And in particular, when you do this Heisenberg evolution, because you're only doing this backwards evolution, you don't care what happens by the horizon near the singularity and so forth. Okay, so this is all very familiar and how you do the things in the sort of canonical way. Um, so just going to, uh, to emphasize the uh, path integral perspective on this, uh, because it might be slightly uh, less familiar. Um, so the way you do this is um, is using a sort of in-in or Schwinger-Keldish formalism. So um, because we want to be, because we're not doing a complete measurement, uh, we're not measuring things that fall into the black hole, this is really the right right way to do things. Uh, and, um, and it requires this doubled space time. So one way of thinking of this Heisenberg evolution is it's conjugating this O with some time evolution operator. So you need to U O U dagger or something where U is the operator that evolves back from scry plus back to scry minus. And we can think of, of our two space times. One of them is computing the matrix elements of U and one of them is computing the matrix elements of U dagger, so to speak. So this is why you have, have two of them. Uh, and uh, in particular, these two guys are going to be these two contours are glued together on some future Cauchy surface sigma plus. So these, this, this future Cauchy surface and this future Cauchy surface are identified. Uh, good. And um, and exactly where this Cauchy surface lies doesn't matter by um, by sort of unitarity of the theory. If I move this Cauchy surface a little, then then it won't affect the answer. Okay. And in particular, we can see that because we've uh, joined this geometry as sigma plus, the the part to the future of sigma plus where the singularity lives is just not required part of the calculation. It's not part of the geometry we're using. We're just using, so it's, that's why it's sort of grayed out. So it's completely uh, irrelevant. 
And this is how it shows up in this path integral calculation. Okay, so this is perfectly standard quantum field theory, um, although perhaps in a slightly unfamiliar setting. Um, we now just have to, it's, uh, to upgrade ourselves from quantum field theory and a fixed background up to dynamical gravity. And we all know what's going to happen. The black hole is going to evaporate. So the, the Hawking radiation is going to back react and so forth. Um, and you're going to get a space time that looks something like this, or at least if we only allow ourselves to know about classical physics, it looks something like this, uh, where there's a, a horizon that shrinks to zero size. Once the horizon is Planckian, we don't really know what happens. So we're, we're guessing once we get there's some null congruence here where, uh, where we don't know what happens anymore because it depends on some Planckian physics. But we're always going to ask questions about what happens uh, before this time. So we're going to, to not worry about that. We're not, not going to need to worry about that, that Planckian physics. Um, and, uh, and it's basically this, the calculation of, of anything we might like is, is basically just the same thing as before. It's just the space time has, has got some dynamics that involves the black hole slowly shrinking and so forth. Okay. Um, so this is just a sort of review of how this path integral formulation works uh, for, um, for computing Hawking radiation expectation values and so forth. So let's now turn to the operator we're actually interested in. So we're going to take this, these two black holes that, and construct a density matrix, row two of U for two copies of Hawking radiation. And we're going to ask what the expectation value is of the swap operator, which I can write as this trace. Um, so the boundary conditions involve two sets of preparing. So this is preparing some initial state uh, down here. And uh, so this is the thing that prepares the density matrix of the first black hole. And this big black question mark is saying, I have to sum over geometries in the interior. I don't know what that is. I'm just fixing things at, at this asymptotic region. Uh, and then this is my second copy of the black hole. And the swap operator just means I have to glue together these two asymptotic regions as I've indicated with these uh, red and green arrows. So our task is to sum over all the geometries we can find that are going to be subtle points to this um, uh, action uh, that have these boundaries. And that's going to give us the expectation value of the swap operator. And um, the obvious subtle point here is we just take exactly this thing that we were, we were talking about before, and we just have two copies of it. So that's sort of fairly obvious. And we will know what result we get from, from computing the entropy in this, uh, or the swap entropy, I should say, in this, um, uh, using this subtle point, it's the thermal entropy of the Hawking radiation which just increases forever and is in tension with this, um, with this interpretation of the bekenstein hawking entropy as a density of states. But we now know that there's another subtle point, which is the, the replica wormhole. Uh, and uh, that gives you an answer for the, well, it gives you a, a, another contribution to the entropy, which if, that looks like this green curve. It gives you basically the bekenstein hawking entropy. And then the dominant subtle point uh, switch, uh, swaps from this one to this one at the page. Okay, so the next thing we have to do is talk about the, the, the replica one hole. But um, I'll re pause again to see if uh, there are questions about what we've done so far, sort of these boundary conditions and so forth. I don't see any questions. Why don't you? Good. So it's either crystal clear or I've lost everyone. I hope it's first. Um, okay, so, so it's now time to talk about replica one hole. And I'm. Um, uh, I'll take just a little bit of time on this because uh, this Lorentzian picture going on is probably uh, new to most people and it took a bit of figuring out to, to work out the right way of thinking about this uh, in Lorentzian signature. Um, yeah, it's a, I really want to focus on Lorentzian signature because ultimately we're going to want to think about the Hilbert space interpretation of this and that, that's really um, going to be most natural in, in um, Lorentzian signature. Good. So this is what it looks like. Uh, we have this future Cauchy surface. So with the Hawking wormhole, we would join this future Cauchy surface here to this future Cauchy surface here. Uh, but we're now going to split it into two pieces. So sigma x, the exterior piece, and i, which is the, the island. Uh, and the exterior piece we're going to join as, as before. So the, the, and this is really required by the boundary conditions is the, the, the way we have to identify the asymptotically is, is part of the boundary conditions. So we didn't have a choice about this, but we're going to choose to 
identify the island in this non-trivial way. So, uh, so the island also has this this uh, swap. Uh, but you know, part of the boundary conditions was identifying the asymptotic regions with a swap operator. So that was something that's, that's fixed as, as part of the specification of what we're doing. But this swap of the island is something that's dynamical. It's something that the geometry is sort of chosen to do, or it's something we have to sum over in the in the path integral because we're summing over all, all possible uh, geometries. Um, so, uh, yeah, so this in particular location of the island, so gamma here is the boundary of the island, is this uh, surface, this splitting surface. Uh, uh, this is going to be dynamically determined to hopefully find a subtle point that looks like this. And um, Okay, and this part of the story is, um, is sort of well known. Uh, and I won't uh, go th through it in, in a great deal of detail, but uh, just a, a, a brief summary of the sort of status of where we are is that, so this is, we're trying to construct this sort of replica wormhole as a subtle point for, in this case, n equals two, two copies of the, of the black hole. Um, but for, for these integer n's, this is a really hard problem. As you can see, this is that they involve some large back reaction and finding the metric and so forth is, is very, very difficult. Uh, particular given my the last comment on this slide. Um, but luckily we can get a lot of evidence for the fact that these subtle points exist by doing a, a trick, uh, which is uh, basically goes back to Lefkowitz and Maldacena of uh, reformulating this path integral in a way that makes sense for any real value of n bigger than one. And so we, we're not tied anymore to integer n. So you can generalize the path integral so that it, it matches onto to this calculation for integer n, but it but it, you can smooth the dial n. And in particular, we can then study that when n is very close to one, uh, which is this formal limit where we're talking about swap von Neumann entropies rather than Renyi entropies. Uh, and we arrive at this, um, this quantum extreme or surface rule, which is uh, sort of the souped up root in the formula in the formulation given by Engelhardt and Wall. Um, and so this is a formula we're hopefully all very familiar with now. Um, and uh, the Upshot is that in an evaporating black hole, there is a non-trivial quantum extremal surface, and it does uh, does what I've claimed it does earlier. Um, yeah, so for finite n, uh, the actual subtle point geometry is going to be uh, involve some complex metric. Um, this is something that might be alarming at first, but you should remember this is just something that happens when you do subtle point evaluations of integrals when they're very oscillatory. So we've got a Lorentzian integral with some phases. The phases are going to to rapidly oscillate, they're mostly going to cancel out, but there's going to be something residual left over. And that something is captured by deforming the path integral off into the contour, off into the complex plane and finding a subtle point to go through. And, um, uh, and so this complex geometry is really capturing uh, a load of real Lorentzian geometries, but which have very um, rapid oscillating contributions to the path integral. But, Three. Herman, Herman uh, would like to ask a question. So Herman, can you unmute yourself? Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure um, I, I tried to ask the questions earlier, but uh, technologically I, I didn't time it right. But um, so I, I want to make sure if you're here doing your path integral, your semi-classical path integral to compute uh, a density matrix, or are you computing uh, a particular um, uh, entropy here. Um, uh, I'm particularly asking about the, the boundary conditions you have indeed um, at your uh, scribe plus. Uh, uh, yeah, so here I'm computing this this expectation value of the swap operator specifically. So I'm not computing some general density matrix element. Um, yeah, so these these boundary conditions are really involve this um, particular operator that I'm that I'm interested in. Right. So, so, so basically, you're not you're not injecting any energy essentially at at scribe plus, because that energy would immediately change your your, your saddle point. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, so this sort of um, when I wrote this diagram here, for example, with with like projections onto some pure state, that's really a very formal thing. If you really project onto a pure state, it would inject some infinite energy and so forth. So this is right. really a shorthand for how I should glue these things together and insert operators and so forth. And at the moment, I'm gluing it together with the insertion of this swap operator. That's the idea. Okay. okay. Thanks for the question. Um, 
Yeah, there's a question about this future Cauchy slice, Sigma X joined, whether it's uh, there's a specific way I should be matching it at future time like infinity. So um, a point to emphasize here is that everything that I've grayed out that lies to the future of this Cauchy surface is, is not part of the geometry. So in particular, this future time like infinity or uh, this whole piece of scribe plus is just not part of the geometry. Uh, I completely exclude it. I, I have two sort of, I, I have to say, only this piece that lies between sort of been bounded by this future Cauchy slice and glued together along that future Cauchy slice. Uh, so it really um, it excises this strong curvature region and so forth. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, good. Um, I should get on with um, talking about baby universes. Uh, so this is the the um, the upshot of this calculation is that this swap entropy uh, really follows the, the page curve because there's this transition, a first order phase transition between the the, the naive saddle and this replica wormhole saddle. Um, but now there's a puzzle, uh, and we have to to try to understand this. And this is um, more or less equivalent to what Raphael described uh, yesterday, and and in um, a couple of papers. Uh, uh, with Maria Tomasovic and uh, Liz Wildenhain as, uh, as the state paradox is, uh, is the following. So for Hawking's calculation of the state of radiation, or if you like the expectation value of operators acting on the state of radiation, we haven't found, an, found anything that's new. We haven't changed the, the old picture uh, in any way. Uh, and in particular, if you were to compute the entropy in the sort of obvious way, which is you work out all the density matrix elements you compute trace of row log row, then you would get Hawking's old answer. There's no new insight there that, that I've given so far. Um, but at the same time, the swap of swap entropy has changed completely. So there's some puzzle there. We have to resolve it. And the resolution is that the um, is that the two copies of Hawking radiation are not uh, given by the density, the two copy density matrix is not just two copies of the single copy density matrix. And um, uh, yeah, so this means the, the, the entropy, the von Neumann entropy computed by the, the formula trace row log row is different from the swap, swap entry. Sorry, uh, Ahmed has a question. So, yes. Sorry, Ahmed, go ahead, try and unmute yourself. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, is it clear that the calculation on the left hand side is a controlled one? I imagine you might be able to compute it for simple i and j, but for complicated i and j, I don't think we have any definitive statement. Um, no, I, it's, yeah. So you could argue that it's um, the, uh, the very complicated i and j, it's a complicated calculation, but, um, but we, we don't have any controlled corrections to Hawking's calculation. It looks self-consistent and gives you basically a thermal state of radiation and we don't know any corrections to that that are significant. I, I, I really think the, the, the more conservative thing to say is that it's just not a controlled calculation. For, for simple matrix elements, you'd reproduce Hawking's calculation, but in general, we don't know. So we haven't found because we weren't able to compute, I think is the more fair interpretation there. Um, So I think that the, well, okay. Another way of saying it is that the density matrix is equivalent to knowing the expectation value of every possible operator. And, um, and um, yeah, and we don't have, I, I don't think there's anything that goes wrong if you insert many, many, many operators uh, at Scribe Plus. It, uh, you can do Hawking's calculation, it's perfectly controlled. Even if you, even if you measure a Hawking radiation every light crossing time. That's an exponentially complicated calculation. It's the Hawking's calculation, I think, is still well controlled. But um, I, I don't see anything that goes wrong with it. There's, there's um, one. Uh, no, I, 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 in principle, I agree that maybe the fact that when you have exponentially many operator insertions, that could have an effect. That's a reasonable uh, point of view, but we don't know a way of uh, uh, quantifying that, that effect. Juan, Juan has a question or he raised his hand. Can you unmute yourself, Juan? Yeah. Well, I, I think that this, this calculation 
is an example of putting a complicated operator and it changes the space-time geometry. Right? Uh, so I think I view the calculation on the right as an example of uh, what Ahmed was saying, that if you compute a very complicated operator, you might get a different answer. Yeah, that's, well. I mean, we are lucky in this case in the right that it's given by a simple geometry, but uh, because it's yeah. a really nice operator. So I'm very sympathetic to the idea that there might be a, a one copy version of this, uh, but we don't know what it looks like in the moment. And it seems to my mind unlikely that you'd be able to describe it in semi-classical gravity, but that's perhaps just my own prejudices. Okay. okay. So I, at, at the moment there's a puzzle, but that is, that is certainly a possible resolution is that when you ask about complicated operators, then something important changes. The question is what important changes and why? Okay, um, good. So um, the next step is to ask about the Hilbert space interpretation of this. How are we doing for some 10 minutes? Okay. Um, so to talk about the Hilbert space interpretation, it's a bit involved with the replica wormholes in some ways. It's all the details are in the, in the paper and, and it's uh, 80 something pages long, which I apologize because some of the, the details take a bit of time to, to set everything up. Uh, but you can get the main idea by going to a, a simplified setting, which was, uh, it's really equivalent to something that was described by Paul Tricantic and Strominger in the 90s. Um, and you can think of that as a natural extrapolation of, uh, of the current um, new ideas about um, islands and so forth. Is uh, this replica wormhole, if you go to very, very late times, uh, the, the island gets larger and larger and larger and extrapolating uh, to sort of the end of evaporation, it becomes the entire interior of the, uh, of the um, black hole. And we end up with a picture that looks like this, where now we're doing complete measurements on, uh, on Scry Plus, uh, except we do some swap of the entire interior of the black hole. And this is basically the picture that was described by, by Polkinski and Stromager, inspired by some sort of um, open string sort of model of gravity. But, um, but this is the main, the main idea. Okay, so this involves some assumptions. It doesn't really make sense semi-classically anymore because we, we, we have to care about what goes on at the endpoint of evaporation and so forth, uh, but it's, but it's a sort of simple model that, that makes uh, many of these points um, clear. So this is just a, a way to, to explain the ideas. Okay, and in this context, we can see what the two copy density matrix would look like, uh, where we've got these two subtle points. So this is the two copies of the uh, original sort of Hawking wormhole. So it gives you uh, just a product state of row H here is the density matrix from that, that Hawking likes, or the Hawking computed it, if you like. Um, the second one, which involves a swap of the indices. So a, a, a less basis way of writing that is that the density matrix on two copies is uh, one plus swap of the density matrix acting on, um, uh, acting on the tensor product state. In particular, because the swap operator squares to one, uh, this row two is invariant under the swap operator. So. Uh, guarantees that the, the swap operator, you measure it, you always get one. And that's the signifier of, of having a pure state. Uh, but of course, the actual single copy state is still highly mixed with the Hawking state. So this is how the, the idea of how these two ideas of you know, the swap entropy can be different from the von Neumann entropy and a measurement can give you something that, that looks um, pure while the actual state is mixed. Um, so now the Hilbert space interpretation of this, we'll start with, uh, sort of familiar Hilbert space interpretation of just Hawking's calculation, uh, which is that if you take one copy here, so this ket piece of the um, uh, of the space time, this computes matrix elements of uh, some uh, state on uh, not just scry plus, but also on the interior of the black hole. So it computes these matrix elements psi a i, where i labels a, a basis on scry plus and a labels a basis on the black hole interior. Uh, and when we identify these two guys in the ENN uh, sort of schwinger keldish way, uh, this is in the Hilbert space language, just a, a sum over intermediate states. So we're, uh, we're tracing out this A, if you like, is this interior. And rho is mixed because it's, uh, rho is a mixed state because of the entanglement with this um, system we've traced out. It's the black hole interior. Okay, now we'll do this with several copies. Uh, so we just have two copies of the same uh, we start off with just two copies uh, of this state on uh, now two copies of Scry plus and two black hole interiors. 
And this label BU is the is to say this is a Hilbert space of what I'll call baby universes, which are these sort of closed universes of the interiors of black holes that split off once the black hole evaporates. Uh, the important thing is that these Polchinski Strominger wormholes modify uh, or give some new contribution to the, the inner product on this space of black hole interiors. It's not just the first term, which is, which is what we get if we have the tensor product, if the, the Hilbert space of baby universes is just the tensor product of the two interiors, but there's the second term. So in, in the context of Polchinski Strominger, it's telling us that the baby universes actually form a Fox space. So they're, they're, they're Baby universes act like uh, indistinguishable bosons, uh, which so you get this symmetrized inner product. But the general um, the general lesson here, which which generalizes in a way I'll describe in a moment, is that when you have wormholes, uh, they modify the inner product in gravity. This is something that's uh, again familiar from many different uh, contexts. Is that uh, is that wormholes or yeah, lots of effects in quantum gravity can be thought of as a modification of the inner product. And in this context, it's an inner product uh, modification of this, this Hilbert space of, of baby universes, which are the sort of black hole interiors. And because we've modified this inner product away from just this tensor product of each of the copies, you can have this, this phenomenon where the, uh, the different sets of Hawking radiation get correlated. And this is a very general story. So this is the, the end copy version of that. We have these, um, uh, let's just repeat this calculation with n size that represent the sort of forward evolution and n sidebars that represent the backward evolution. And then there's this tensor product where we're sort of tracing out this piece of the, of the baby universes. And this now might be very complicated. It might involve contributions from replicable wormholes and so forth. So it's not just this, um, this simple um, um, sort of fox space in a product, but it involves, say an island, for example, is like a swap operator that's acting on just part of the black hole interior. So it does some mixing up of the various indices and so forth. So it's, it's something very complicated, but one detail we always, uh, is always going to be preserved uh, is that it's going to be invariant under some permutations. And a nice property that's not, not obvious uh, immediately, but a nice property of these inner products is that you can always write it uh, in this form. So if you ignore this integral to begin with, there's some parameters alpha, which have labels, which have the same labels as the, uh, as the orthonormal basis of, of baby universes. And, uh, and this inner product factorizes into a product of, of the different pieces, uh, except we then, the cost is we have to integrate over, over some measure. And the, the, the details of the measure might be complicated and depend on the details, but from very general principles, we know it, it's, it exists. So for the, um, for the polchinski strominger example, where it was a Fox space, this measure is just a Gaussian. Uh, this is a familiar thing that a simple harmonic oscillator gives you a Fox space. Uh, so this is a, a Gaussian and you just sum up with contractions. Um, uh, but replica wormholes, they sort of add, um, they add cubic and cortic interactions and so forth. So they, they, they're sort of, it's like adding interactions to, um, to this, uh, to this measure. Um, and um, okay. in the end, the way we interpret this is that the uh, we get some n copy density matrix on Scry plus that looks like uh, pure states because uh, we're taking the the, uh, the entire state on plus up to this integral over this measure. So uh, coming to the end, so we can. Um, just wrap it up. Uh, the important thing then we've, we've arrived at is that there are correlations between different copies of Hawking radiation, but they are very special correlations. They have this form of, uh, of a, a classical mixture of possibilities labeled by these, these auxiliary parameters alpha that we introduced, so-called alpha parameters. And uh, in particular, one copy of Hawking radiation is some statistical mixture of many possibilities uh, rho alpha where rho alpha follows the page curve, but the mixture doesn't, it follows the Hawking set. Uh, and the, these correspond to these different possible states of, um, of these baby universes that we've, that we've traced out. So this is uh, basically the idea of Coleman and Giddings and Strominger uh, that uh, wormholes induce super selection sectors. Okay, so we can finish off with just a few comments. Uh, this is um, almost my last slide. Um, yeah, second to last slide, I think. Um, 
Yeah, so a few comments. Uh, first of all, this isn't, um, so this, is, this is just ordinary quantum mechanics. Uh, there's no funny business going on with, you, know, you might think that having ensembles like this is a uh, is departure from quantum mechanics, but really it's, uh, it has an ordinary quantum mechanical description, but it involves this sort of very Hilbert space of closed universes. Um, and uh, these asymptotic observers, uh, they sort of, um, fit into the usual description of, of super selected observers because they all commute. In other words, if I do a measurement on two different black holes, uh, the measurement on, on black hole one and the measurement on black hole two, it doesn't matter what order I do them in if they're uh, sort of well separated. Um, it's also shown up some an implicit assumption then that was there in, in Hawking's calculation, which is about this state of closed universes. And this state is, is equivalent to uh, this measure, d mu alpha. This is equivalent to the the overlap of some special states of closed universes with this this no boundary state that was implicitly uh, implicitly used there. Um, so then we might ask um, what this looks like if we live in a single super selection sector. We don't want to describe the Hawking matrix. We want to describe one of these row alphas that follows the page curve. Uh, and uh, this, because this involves sort of cutting the uh, cutting the along the interior of the black hole, it looks a lot like a, a final state projection. You can make that a bit more um, precise, but, um, but this is sort of the suggestion of how it should look in a um, in each super selection sector. Um, yeah, I, the, I won't go through all of these in detail, but um, but the important thing to say is, it, it, in the end, we've used semi-classical gravity, and we've got a complete and coherent picture of what's uh, of what's going on, where uh, everything fits together in a consistent way. Uh, but it really requires us to accept these ideas of of super selection sectors. And um, the last slide was about how this might be. Uh, Intention with ADS CFT, um, but perhaps yeah, I'd like to have some time for for questions. So maybe I'll I'll um, leave that up, and if people want to ask about them, then they're free to. But, um, thanks for your attention, and I hope to have some questions and discussions over the next few days. Okay, let's all thank um, Henry for a terrific talk. Uh, there are questions, and people are lining up. So I'm going to start with uh, Xiao Lang. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? Oh, um, hi, Henry. I'm, I wonder um, if you apply this uh, this calculation of overlap between states. Um, if you consider two different states, different by a small perturbation in the island, like like one in one case it's like it's uh, the original geometry. The other case, I create an additional particle there. Um, well, will you see the overlap? Um, like, like what, what will you see about like whether that information is, is powered from not? Uh, yeah, so this, this is a, a great question. It's not something I've sort of worked out in, uh, in great detail, but, um, but yeah, uh, roughly speaking, you, so this is you, know, you prepare some different initial states, uh, then uh, you expect the super selection sectors to have the sort of error correction property that uh, exactly when the island stains it, that's then that, that will change uh, the different contributions from the replica saddles, and and then that would match the expectations from the sort of quantum error correction picture from the from the boundary, and. And then you see um, that if, uh, if it's not in the island, then, then you basically get the same state. Um, yeah, so if it's not in the island, basically, if you have two possible orthogonal states, it just it tells you whether you're allowed to join, uh, join them up with or without a swap. So if you, if you have two orthogonal states that are one bra piece and one ket piece, uh, if they're the same, you get to join them up and you get a non-zero contribution. But if they're orthogonal, then the piece, the, the contribution that involves joining those two together uh, becomes zero. So it, it sort of excludes a particular replica wormhole and that then emulates this sort of quantum error correction property. Uh, but yeah, um, it, it's good to work out some of the details and make sure that, that everything is sort of consistent there. Um, yeah, like in these Potensky Strominger wormholes, there's some, it's not, yeah, it doesn't 100% work out, but um, there's some exponential corrections that are problematic. But. Uh -huh. Let's move on, Raphael, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Henry, for the great talk. Um, I just uh, have 
one question. You said that in the end, everything is completely consistent, but um, one thing that the central dogma would tell us is that the out state is a particular pure state if I, if I make the black hole from a particular in state. And a measurement that I could do, which is I think much simpler, or at least not more difficult than the ones that you were doing on the many copies, is I could just measure the out state in a basis that includes the expected state. And I would then expect with 100% probability uh, to, get, to get that, that state. And would you agree that we, we, we don't yet know how to make that consistent with, with, uh, with the uh, thermal state that appears in the calculation? So the consistent picture here is that semi-classical gravity does not offer a question, offer an answer to the question what the pure state is. It offers you a, a statistical prediction. It says, so it's um, uh, operationally, it's like someone telling you that, uh, that the world is described as a standard model, uh, but it gives you a probability distribution for the various parameters in that, in that theory. And you have to go and measure and find out what they are. So it doesn't give you a specific prediction for the, for, for the, uh, for the final state of radiation, but if you do very, very, very careful measurements of exponentially many black holes, eventually you'll work out what that state is. And then subsequent measurements will always be consistent with that. And so it's not consistent with the central dogma if you interpret it as being a unique quantum system where, where you've told me what the Hamiltonian is. It says it's some quantum system, but you have to figure out the Hamiltonian for yourself by some experiments. Sure, but I think that means that we should not... Um give too much credence to the space-time pictures that come with Hawking's calculation, in particular, the smooth horizon that appears in that, in that picture. I think uh, we should so give credence to the, to the answer that the entropy at the end is zero, uh, because yeah. we have other reasons as well to believe that that's the right answer. Yeah, so this is perhaps yeah, partly, yeah, maybe this comment is once you've done many, many exponentially many measurements, then, uh, then you've really, there's a reason to expect the semi-classical approximation to break down. This is much better than the situation before. Uh, so before we were like, okay, if the, if the information has to come out, the semi-classical approximation has to break down, but why does it break down? But now it's because there are exponentially many other space times, there are many other ways to connect it. Summing over those, those connections is sort of some divergence theories that you need to complete in, somehow, uh, in some way. So uh, there's a sort of parameter telling us the, when the semi-classical approximation is broke down. And that's what we expect. We don't want an effective theory to give us a perfect answer, but we want it to, to when it's breaking down, we want to know why it's breaking down. And, and now we understand that. In, in, I, I, com I completely agree. Yeah, in particular, I agree that it's definitely much better than before. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna move it along. So, uh, Yasunori, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Henry, it was a great talk. Um, I have one comment and one question. Um, the, the, the comment is about your Bekenstein Hawking uh, unitarity or central dogma. And you said that's uh, beyond uh, uh, usual unitarity because of this uh, area law. And I don't think we, we need to view it that way. Or in fact, perhaps it would maybe better not to view that way. When you talk about unitarity, you're talking about a unitary time evolution as viewed from distance. Uh, that's uh, from boundary, uh, if you want. In that case, your time slice, like short serial time slice, on that, the statement of Bekenstein Hawking entropy is simply usual uh, Planck density statement, namely order one qubit per uh, uh, Planck length uh, volume. Okay. Uh, like stretch horizon is a Planck distance away from uh, from uh, mathematical horizon. Yeah. So it's just a perfect unit in a Planck density. And the question of over density happens only if you switch to a global space-time picture, including an uh, interior. And that you need to be done carefully using the right effective theory if you view from a uh, uh, distance. So in, in general, I claim that you should not you know, mix or conflate the two pictures uh, based on a global space-time picture and then uh, and, and distance. So uh, in, in that sense, it's just a unitary, unitary. And okay. You may not yeah, so that, just, but, um, but just, so, yeah, yeah. But, the reason I wanted to, to really distinguish that is um, yeah, we wanted these ideas to be accessible to a wide audience because they're not really using any UV properties. Yeah, okay. And yeah. there is there is a community of people who believes that in the yellow curve, yeah. who believes okay. that black holes have many, 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 well, infinitely many interior state that will eventually be returned once a black hole becomes Planckian. 
I think okay. that has lots of problems with rem, uh, with you know pair production and so forth. Okay. But it's it's you know, lots of people believe this, and that's a perfectly good thing to to. Okay. Okay. Uh, but but uh, the question is, they would say just, it's unitary, yeah. but it's not. Yes, but it's yeah. um, doesn't satisfy this. Okay. Well. I really want to go the question. Then, uh, question is, in fact, enough. I may have already asked, and you may have already answered. But uh, and this statement is that if you take uh, alpha vacuum, uh, not alpha, sorry, uh, 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 like a baby universe and uh, uh, dimension one, hard Hawking state initially then you're automatically doing uh, uh, ensemble average. That I, I, I think it's great, beautiful, but that's really just the calculation is that, and you could do in the semi-classical uh, calculation or setup, think about setup, where the black hole is literally formed by some stars or material. In that case, black hole microstate corresponds to really like a semi-classical configuration, one-to-one. <laughs> -one. And then you, you still must be able to ask that what's happening in an out state in a, a single copy. So that's why you'd probably have to go to something Juan and the armed says it to understand it, right? I mean, it's, do you agree with that? Like in that setup, you cannot say that the initial state doesn't uh, know the micro state because uh, it's a hard to hooking state. No, you just form in Minkowski, you just form by particular matter configuration, particular micro state and then form it. And then you uh, uh, correct the hooking radiation. Then you still have to go back to the original question that what's happening in this single copy versus multiple copies. I'm not sure I got all the, the details of the question. Perhaps we can um, perhaps we can chat offline or, oh, yeah, yeah. or okay. the, the meeting so you can explain your a little more. I'm I, I there are some more questions, but I'm I'm gonna have to cut things off because we have another talk. So that's let's all uh, Thank Henry again for a terrific talk. I think that was great. And it stimulated a lot of discussion and I'll encourage everybody to go take a look at the Slack channel where you can uh, have further uh, interactions there with Henry. And I'm sure he'd be happy to answer. Um,